William Linwood Montel book entitled Ghosts Along the Cumberland, Death War in the Kentucky Foothills. person who died were old, they were always buried in a black coffin. They were dressed in black. The older women were buried in black dresses and usually had a triangular black scarf tied over the head and knotted at the throat. Young people had white clothing and white coffins. When a death occurred, a string or handkerchief was tied around the chin to draw the mouth together. The corpse was kept in the home a very short time because there was no method for preserving the body. So the casket and body were placed in a wagon, drawn by horses and taken to the family graveyard which probably included only two or three members of the immediate family. If the corpse was kept in the home overnight, a death watch was conducted. In other words, two or three persons sat up with the corpse throughout the entire night. The corpse was never to be left alone until it was buried. The reason for this custom was to protect the corpse from rats, which infested almost every farmstead. When a person died, the friends spread the news over the area and let all know about it. Then someone laid the body out. There was no embalming. A rag with soda water was kept on the face of the corpse at all times to keep off the outer effects of death. The body was laid out at home and the friends and relatives came in and sat up with the corpse at night to keep the cats off the corpse. Embalming wasn't practiced in Taylor County until the 1930s. Before that time, preparation for burial included bathing and dressing the corpse. Quarters were placed on the eyes and a cloth was tied around the chin and the top of the head to prevent the mouth from opening. If a person died one day, he was buried the next day. Some people claim if you will touch a corpse, you will never again be afraid of the dead.
It is the cause of death for a door to open without apparent cause. When someone was real bad and was going to die, some kind of a noise would occur in the house. It is bad luck to dream of muddy water, for someone in the family will be sick or will die. If you plant a cedar tree and it dies, there will be a death in the family. If you plant a willow tree, by the time the tree gets big enough to shade your grave, you will die. If a cat is in the house with a sick person and the cat starts screaming and crying, carrying on, it's a sign the sick person is going to die. Every frog you kill makes your life shorter. When a dog rolls over on his back and stays still, you'll hear of a death. If a rooster crows and his tail is towards the door, then someone is going to die in the family. If a rooster comes up on your front steps and crows, there will be a death in the family. I always heard it was bad luck to hear a hen crow, so people would always kill the hen when it would crow. As soon as they'd hear a hen crow, they'd go kill it. And they said you'd have a death in the family if you didn't. So I had a little hen and I thought so much of it. It would go down to a panel of the fence, the same panel, every day for three days, and fly up on that fence and crow. But I wouldn't kill it, because I didn't believe in it. But I didn't believe in it. It wasn't long until I had a death in the family. If a bird flutters against a window, it means death to someone inside. If a screech owl hollers three times and flies away, it is a sign of death. If a whippoorwill lights on a sick person's bedpost and sings, death will follow. If a lightning bug got into the house, there would be a death. And if you kill a lightning bug, the lightning will kill you during the next thunderstorm. If a measuring worm is on someone, it is measuring that person for a coffin. Churches and funeral homes were built. The white families buried their own people and conducted their own funerals. Some relative or neighbor who could do carpenter work constructed a plain wooden box for a casket. A carpenter or a cabinet maker selected some type of wood such as oak, chestnut, or poplar. Then it was cut and stored in the barn loft season out. Sometimes the person who was buried made his own caskets. Until the death did occur, the casket was used for the storage of things, 
such as potatoes or onions for the winter. Caskets were made in an oblong shape, small at the top, wide at the shoulders, and small at the foot. When someone died, the cabinet maker would go to the home and get the measurements of the corpse in order to know the size that the casket was to be made. The inside of the casket was stuffed with cotton or linen with black or white silk, which was bought at the local general store. This type of casket came to be known as the mummy casket, and the people who made this particular type were known as the toothpick casket makers of Witherspoon Manufacturing Company. Some years after the mummy coffins were made, the bedside coffin came into use. This was a stronger and better built casket than the mummy coffin and was placed on a stand or trestle until the corpse was hauled to the grave. The homemade coffins used during pioneer days were made of wood, usually pine, walnut, or cherry and were perfectly rectangular. The original wood coffins were made in a manner that the corpse was fully revealed, meaning the entire lid was made to be removed. Later, the pattern was changed to allow only a partial view of the corpse. The corpse should always be taken from the house feet first. Take care, take a casket in a house head first and out feet first. Yes. Friends of the deceased usually carried the casket if the distance to the graveyard wasn't too far. The first motor coaches or hearse entered the area in 19 and 25 before the funeral homes were so popular. Many times the undertakers rode on mules to go and bomb people. Sometimes in the earlier days there was no funeral service conducted if a death occurred during harsh winter weather. In such a case, the funeral was usually set for spring of the year or during fair weather so that the people could get to the burial site. The service was short, and if a preacher could not attend the funeral, some well-known relative or neighbor conducted the service. Someone usually read a passage from the Bible, and another would pray. People who attended the funerals, whether friends or relatives, always wore black. This custom first originated in England, and it was a tradition for the people to mourn for several days after the death of one of the family or a close relative. This was especially true of women who had to wear black clothes and enter the stage of mourning for a certain period of time. If this tradition was not practiced, neighbors and other people would accuse the woman of not paying respect to the dead. Men didn't wear black as long as women because they had duties of making a living and couldn't remain in a lengthy state of mourning. A funeral service was called a burial. It was an established custom in the mid-1800s to have the funeral service in the month of May this custom was observed because the conditions of road in the winter months made it almost impossible to travel. Very few flowers were used at funerals, and those that were brought by a relative or some kind neighbor had all the foliage picked off and were tied in round bundles, sometimes with a scrap of ribbon, but more often with a string. Every time someone died, and when there were flowers at all in season, 
My mother would send a huge bouquet to the grave. They'd take the shovel handle and stick it down in the grave mound and then pour water in the hole. Then they would stick the bouquet in it. didn't have flowers unless their relatives stopped to pick a few wild ones. It is bad luck to count the bunches of flowers at a funeral. Funerals were horrible in those days, especially to children. I remember distinctly being at a funeral of an old man who had passed away in our neighborhood. His coffin was set on planks laid beside his grave. He had long black hair and a black beard. His eyes were partly open and his mouth was open. When the relatives gathered to view the remains, some went into hysteria. Others pushed one another aside to get a closer view. Shady Grove, my little love, Shady Grove, I know. Shady Grove, my little love, bound to the Shady Grove. Cheeks as red as a blooming rose, eyes of the deepest brown. You are the darling of my heart, stable sun goes down. Shady Grove, my little love, Shady Grove, I know. Shady Grove, my little love, bound to the Shady Grove. Shady Grove, my little love, standing in the door. Shoes and stockings in her hands, little bare feet on the floor. Shady Grove, my little love, Shady Grove, I know. Shady Grove, my little love, bound for the Shady Grove. Wish I had a big fine horse, corn to feed him on. My little love, Shady Grove, I know. Shady Grove, my little love, bound for the Shady Grove. There was a haunted house down in Russell County, Kentucky, which was said to be haunted. One man decided to stay all night in his house to show that the house was really haunted. He built a fire in the stove and settled down for a peaceful night. As night came, a cat came in and sat on one side of him. And then another cat came in and sat down on the other side. The cats looked at each other, then looked at the man, and then looked back at each other. Then one cat said to the other, Shall we eat him now or wait till John comes? The man did not wait for the other cats to answer. My grandfather's twin sister's husband, she's alive. She's got a good mind for a 94 years old. She is the only one living of the original seven children of that particular family. During the time of about 1915, in the neighborhood of Pitchford Ridge, there used to be one house that stood across from the farm of Jeffrey Skaggs, my great-grandfather, which was apparently to be haunted by a ghost. This was the common joke of the neighborhood. Everyone seemed to add or detract about the ghost and the different things he would do. One time, as a suggestion, my grandfather, James S. Skaggs, suggested that Dr. Ray spend the night in the old haunted house to prove that no such a ghost existed there. Then everyone proceeded to kid Dr. Ray about the haunted house. 
They said he shouldn't be afraid to go because everyone knew there was no such thing as a ghost. And Dr. Ray accepted the challenge. He would stay in the haunted house with no one else with him. So Dr. Ray entered the old house approximately 7.30 and observed any actions of any peculiar being or being unknown. Long sport by bewitching hour of 12 o'clock, Dr. Ray became drowsy and fell asleep, sitting at the table with only a candle to light. Dr. Ray awoke. He heard something coming down the staircase from the old attic toward where he was resting. It was a blurish figure, vaguely resembling a human figure. Dr. Ray leaped toward the door and ran down toward the road. Two miles away, Dr. Ray was running as fast as he could. At his great astonishment, he ran faster than he had ever run in his natural life. After about a mile of this, Dr. Ray became exhausted and proceeded to rest on the stump in the woods. While he was resting on the stump, the figure of the ghost came up behind him and said, that sure was a good race. Dr. Ray replies, yes, and we are fixing to have another. It's as quick as I get my breath. In passing through the village, not many years ago, I stopped to spend the night with a very dear friend whose husband had recently died. This family had once lived very close neighbor to me and I had known the husband very well when he was living. I had supper and spent a very pleasant evening with the family which consisted of the mother and three daughters. When it came time to retire for the night, the mother asked me, if I were afraid to sleep upstairs. After assuring her that I was not afraid to sleep any place in the house, I was shown to my bedroom, which was a small upstairs room with a wall which seemed to separate it from another room. But there was no door leading into it. Everything seemed very quiet and I turned out the light and was soon asleep. I did not know how long I had been asleep, but I was suddenly awakened by a noise which seemed to be in the room, or in the room just behind the wall. It seemed to be a carpenter at work. Such sawing and hammering as I had never heard before. I listened for a few minutes, thinking perhaps it was morning and that someone was up and at work. But I finally decided to turn on the light and see what it was. When I turned on the light, the sawing and hammering stopped. But I could see someone standing in the corner of the room, the husband of the friend with whom I was spending the night. He had on a dark hat, which was slightly drawn over his face. But I had once recognized him. I kept the light on for some time, but I did not speak and he did not make a move, but stood perfectly still with his hammer and saw in his hand. I finally decided that there was no use in alarming the family but to continue staring at him. So I again turned out the light. Immediately the sawing and hammering began as loud as ever. Several times during the night, I would again turn on the light. Each time, the noise would stop and the form of the man would stand perfectly still until the light was out again. The next morning the family asked me if I slept. I replied that something made a lot of noise but that it might have been rats. They looked at me in perfect horror and the mother said it might have been There 
was an old colored fella that would get drunk every weekend. One Saturday night, he cut across the cemetery to take a shortcut home. He fell into a freshly dug grave. He tried and tried to get out, but the side just kept breaking in on him as he tried to climb out. Finally, he gave up and laid down in the corner and went to sleep. Shortly, another fella came through the cemetery and he fell into the same grave. He tried to get out for some time and couldn't make it. He began to cuss and scream and woke up the other fella, the colored fella, still about half asleep, said in a low, husky voice, it's no use, you can't get out. But he was fooled because that other fella went over the side of the grave like a rabbit. This has been Ghosts Along the Cumberland. Selected readings from the William Linwood Montel book entitled Ghosts Along the Cumberland.